In ionic bonding, we learned that one element gives away an electron and another one takes it. In covalent bonding, in its simplest terms, the electrons are shared between atoms. It's defined by the statement, a covalent bond is the electrostatic attraction between shared pairs of electrons and the positively charged nuclei. Let's explore this a little bit further. Here I have two hydrogens, and let's just add to them their valence electrons. And the circle I'm showing here represents the orbital cloud. This can be represented by hydrogen with one electron and a second hydrogen with its electron. I want to explore the forces acting on one of the nuclei. This nuclei experiences a force of repulsion. That repulsion originates from this positively charged nuclei. But simultaneously, it experiences attractions. Those attractions come from the neighboring electron and its own electron. In this particular case, the net force on that hydrogen is towards the other. So it's going to move this way. Now I could do a similar set of forces acting on the other nuclei, but the overall result would be it would tend to want to move in this direction. Let's look at it now a fraction of a second later. So the two move towards each other and their orbitals begin to overlap. And so let's again add our electrons to the picture. This nucleus still experiences a force of repulsion. In fact, a greater force of repulsion because it's now closer to the other nucleus. However, because the electrons of the neighboring atom are closer, it also experiences greater forces of attraction. So in this particular scenario, the net force acting on that nucleus becomes zero. So the net force equals zero. It can also be said that the forces of repulsion and attraction balance. This is the state of lowest energy. And this balancing leads to the formation of the bond between the two, which is often represented in this type of diagram. Suppose we continue to move them closer together. We would still have our electrons present, and there would still be attractive forces for the electrons. But because the positively charged nuclei are so close together, there'd be a tremendous force of repulsion. And that would result in it moving back to the intermediate state where they balance. Gilbert Lewis, an American scientist, invented a technique or means by which we can picture how these bonds form. And it shows all of the valence electrons, both bonded and non-bonded, in a covalently bonded substance. The first thing we need to do is determine how many valence electrons something has. So let's consider oxygen for a moment from its location here in the table. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. The valence electrons are those that are in the highest energy level. So this would have six valence electrons. I'm going to put that above oxygen for a moment, because in fact, everybody in the same family as oxygen would have six valence electrons. Moving to fluorine's family, they all have seven, five, and four. So those are the only ones we'll really need to deal with in this particular, oh, let's go on, sorry. Three for boron and two here and one here. So these numbers represent the number of valence electrons an atom has. So if we were to draw oxygen's picture, um, we could do it a couple of ways. We can show the electrons as dots. So it would have one, two, three, four, five, six. 
Um, we could also use X's instead. Um, we could use lines. Uh, the lines, though, are reserved for pairs of electrons. So we could replace that pair and that pair with a line, but we still would need to have these. So these are all showing the same idea. There's a tendency of atoms to have a valent shell that's filled with eight electrons. It's a tendency, it's not a rule, but most atoms tend to obtain what we call a noble gas configuration with eight valence electrons. An exception to this, of course, would be hydrogen, uh, which couldn't hold eight. It would only need two to look like helium. So here's an example of a, a Lewis formula, and you might have done one similar in class. Oxygen, as I say, has six valence electrons, so I'll put them down here. And let's bring along hydrogen with one valence electron. So that would, could be considered a Lewis formula for the water molecule. Again, I could also draw it using lines, and a line between atoms indicates a pair of electrons being shared between atoms. So this line represents what we call a shared pair of electrons, and this represents what we call a lone pair of electrons. Again, you can use dots or crosses, but remember that lines represent pairs of electrons. Let's look at drawing some more complicated molecules than just water and hydrogen. Here's a sequence of steps I use to determine the Lewis formula for a particular species. So the first thing I'm going to do is determine the number of valence electrons. Well, nitrogens from its location has five, three chlorines at seven apiece. This has a total of 26. So I begin by putting the atom there's fewest of in the middle. So I'll put nitrogen in the middle and I'll surround it then by the chlorines. The first place I put them is connecting with the central atom. So I know the pairs of electrons must reside there. So I've used three pairs of my electrons or six electrons and I still have to locate 20. So I'm now going to go to the atoms on the outside and fill those up. At this point, I've used 24 electrons, or if you want to count quickly, 12 pairs. I still have one pair remaining. I now go to this step. If any of the pairs remain, I give them to the central atom. So that would be it. That would be the Lewis formula for uh, nitrogen trichloride. We'll do the same thing with this species, hydrogen cyanide. One valence electron for hydrogen, four for carbon, and we have uh, five for the nitrogen, giving me a total of 10 electrons, or five pairs. I'll put carbon in the middle, nitrogen, and hydrogen on the other side, and the first place I put them is there. That's at this step. Now complete the octets of the atoms on the outside, so I'll do that. There aren't any remaining pairs, so I don't have this step to follow. Go to the last one. In the event a central atom does not have an octet, move some pairs. So carbon right now only has four electrons. It needs two more pairs, so I'm going to move two. So as a result, I'm going to remove that pair and that pair so that they're now being shared with that central atom, bringing both the carbon and the nitrogen with octets, four pairs of electrons. We can also apply this to drawing ions. So carbon has four, um, three oxygens at six apiece, and the negative two means I have two more electrons, which gives me 24 electrons in my picture. So I'll start here by putting carbon in the middle. I'll put the three oxygens around it. And the first place I put them is there. Let's go on now and complete the octets of those on the outside. And at this point, I've used up all 24 electrons. 
So much as I did in the last case, I'm going to have to move a pair to that central carbon. So let's say I'll move that pair in. That's it. Um, now, because this is an ion, I do need to put it in square brackets and indicate its charge. Well, let's try a couple more. Two carbons, so two times four plus four times the one. That gives me a total of 12 electrons. So in this case, I'm going to put the two carbons in the middle and uh, I'll put two hydrogens around each one, sort of a symmetrical arrangement. And the first place I put them is here. Now I'll end there. Um, now I complete the octets. Well, I've used up 10 electrons, so I'm going to put a pair here. Now, my last step indicates checking if the central atoms have octets. Now the two carbons, one does, one doesn't. So that pair of electrons would best be positioned here, satisfying both carbons' octets. Lastly, let's try this species. Now beryllium has um, two valence electrons and I have two chlorines at seven apiece giving me 16 electrons. I'll put the B in the middle, the beryllium, and we'll put the chlorines on either end. We'll put two pair there. We'll complete the octets on the outside. And at this point I've used up all 16 electrons. Now, if I examine the central atom beryllium in this case, it doesn't have an octet, and I might be inclined here to move more pairs in to satisfy it. But alas, beryllium is a rule breaker. Um, special note of two particular uh, central atoms, beryllium and boron. Uh, these are very small atoms and unable to hold eight electrons in their valence shell. As a result, they're stable with just four and six respectively. So the four going with the beryllium matches what I have here. So I'm actually finished with beryllium chloride.